Hello again and welcome to Catholic Social Teaching 101. I'm Jim Grandin and it's my pleasure today to be continuing with you in this series in which we are still studying that very first principle of Catholic social thought which is respect for life and the dignity of the human being. In our previous two programs we looked at this from the moment of conception but today we wanted to shift gears and look at this as an end-of-life issue and discuss particularly the death penalty. Believe it or not, church teaching on this principle is very clear, strong, and consistent. Since the 1980s, the American Catholic bishops, and then Pope John Paul II, then the second edition of the Catechism, and finally Pope Francis, have clarified and reiterated and very obviously clarified our teaching that the death penalty at <clears throat> this point in history is unnecessary and immoral. We have guests today to help us flesh out these important principles which by and large Catholics are being taught but perhaps not enough and perhaps not well. We have our first guest on the side is Claude Muncy who is at present the Detention Ministry Director for the Diocese of Fresno and works a lot with the chaplains and the inmates of our diocese. In the middle of our table, we have Sister Marie Frances Schoffer, who is a sister of the Congregation of St. Joseph, who is also the Associate Director for Social Justice Ministry serving the entire Diocese of Fresno. And to my right is our very special guest, Bud Welch, who comes to us all the way from Oklahoma City and Bud is going to share with us how his own conviction was severely tested on April 19, 1995 when his beautiful daughter Julie Marie was one of those victims of that awful bombing at the federal building in Oklahoma City. I wonder if each of you could take a moment to share where it is that you began thinking about death penalty abolition, how it was that you came to an understanding of the importance of this teaching, or whatever you'd like to share with our viewers about your conviction about death penalty. Claude, could you begin? Well, <clears throat> I think it's easiest to say that I never really liked it, uh, but it wasn't at the level of some kind of moral certainty but I spent my teenage years living in Germany and we were taken to a lot of different places including places that were places of execution during the Nazi years and that built an understanding of how evil this all was. It really came into focus uh, when I was reading through the, the documents of, the, of uh, John Paul II and the clarity of why in our own time, that it's become unnecessary. We don't need the death penalty to protect anyone. And so there's no justification for it anymore. And that's where I, it be, became moral certainty for me. Thank you, Claude. Sister Marie Francis. I think for me, and I'm glad we're opening with this question because I like to share this. And whenever I have the opportunity, I like to share my experience. Like many people growing up in the 40s and 50s, the death penalty issue wasn't really an overt issue as it is today. And um, we all live along a continuum of, of growth towards gospel teaching. And I remember one night some years ago um, when I was in Los Angeles, I was accustomed when I went to bed at night turning off the light, turning on one of the uh, news stations at that time it was KNX to catch up on the the day's news and eventually I would drop off to sleep wake up 12 30 1 o'clock 1 30 in the morning 
turn off the radio, go back to sleep. But this one morning, and it was during a period of time when I was really teetering, I wasn't quite totally over to no death penalty ever under any circumstances. I woke up to these words. It was not the end of a commercial. It was not the end of a previous news story. These were the exact words I woke up to. So-and-so was executed in San Quentin State Prison at midnight this morning and was pronounced dead at 12.06. Something happened in me when I heard that. And I did turn off the radio. I did not go back to sleep for some time. And as I thought about it, that famous, um, those famous words from the great metaphysical poet John Donne, no man is an island unto itself. Anyone's death diminishes me because I am involved in humankind and therefore never ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And I lay there thinking, what is it that struck me? And I think what struck me for the very first time was that we are bonded to one another far more intimately than our finite minds can even begin to conceive, far more intimately than our hearts are able to experience. And that feeling stayed with me over the years, and I began to associate it with the unity prayer of Jesus that we have towards the end of the Gospel of John. I pray, Father, that they all may be one, as you are in me and as I am in you, that they may be one in us. And it has struck me over and over again, God never gives up on me. God never gives up on us. Who am I to give up on my brother, my sister? Thank you, Sister Marie Francis. When was that um, chronologically, that experience? Chronologically, I really don't know. I've been in Bakersfield since 1998, and this would have been some years before that. I would say sometime, I don't know, the late 80s. Late 80s. I've tried to think back. Yeah. I know where I was. Yeah. I know almost Beautiful. the time. I don't remember the year. Beautiful to have a recollection of clarity and to identify with what is the reality of what we are doing. Bud, tell us <clears throat> how you grew up with a certain sense of death penalty. I, I don't support it. I think probably uh, the most important person in my life in growing up and opposition to the death penalty came about when I was a small child. Uh, listening to uh, my grandfather, a um, good Irish Catholic out of, uh, uh, out of eastern Pennsylvania. And uh, he could see clearly, especially in the uh, Oklahoma Territory before statehood, uh, the, the uh, hanging judge, his name was Judge Parker in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And Judge Parker would just uh, sentence anybody to death that he had the emotion to do it, whether they were guilty or innocent. And so many of them, according to my grandfather, indeed uh, were not guilty. And, uh, and that was his big opposition to the death penalty because he thought far too many innocent people were being put to death. And uh, that continues even to this day. That's so interesting because one thing that Sister Helen Prejean has written about so eloquently in The Death of Innocence is her latest passion is to understand the need to correct the whole system because there are so many and there are two people in particular in this book that she travels all the way to their death with two of her very beloved inmates Innocent, she is sure that they are innocent. There is no way they were guilty. And to think that you had that experience through your grandfather of the awareness of even the system itself is wrong. It's just wrong. Now, Bud, back to you over what happened, though. So you were 
clear on these principles. You saw that it was wrong. But then walk us through a little bit of what was your world being turned upside down on the 19th of April, 1995. I think uh, when that happened, I was, uh, there was very many things going on. Uh, probably initially uh, denial. And uh, of course it took four, four days to uh, find Julie's body. And uh, there was an uncertainty during that four day period of time, which put some other issues uh, on the table. And after her body being found, I immediately turned to the perfectly normal human response of retribution, uh, the revenge factor. And uh, I uh, thought very guilty actually at the time that I felt that way. But I have since learned through my experience that there's nothing abnormal about that. It's very, very normal for human beings to feel that way. And I say to people, I'm often asked many, many times, I go to New York and New Jersey a lot and I speak there and I run into people that were involved in 9-11. And uh, so many times they will look at me and the healing process I have been through and they will ask the question, the standard question is, how did you get where you are today? And, or how do I get where you are? And my normal response to those family members is the most important thing that you have is time. Uh, if you give yourself the time, you will be able to deal with the, with the retribution, the, uh, the anger, all of those things, you'll be able to finally get them to dissipate. Once you get, get past those, then you can be much more rational and re recognize what it is that is going to help you go through the healing process and what absolutely will not help you. And uh, I think that's the important thing that I've, uh, that I've learned. Your travels take you all over the world and I'm wondering if you could highlight one of those experiences and perhaps the panel will have other experiences to share in this manner of where your commitment to a nonviolent forgiving posture, a mercy-filled response to violence, where that somehow even encourages you as it gives hope to others when you spread this message and you've been in so many countries over the last 25 years. Uh, four years ago, I was in, uh, in uh, Mongolia and traveled to Eastern Mongolia and uh, we were having a bit of a conference in this theater and of course we certainly had to use translators and uh, this man uh, asked me the question uh, uh, and it had to be translated to me his question was how do I deal with the fact that I was never told the true the true justice of what took place he had had a daughter that that was killed and uh, he was, uh, he was very distraught about that. It had happened uh, four years before. And uh, I tried to meet an understanding with him, even though the language was, of course, a barrier. And it's even a barrier, even if you have translators, because you're not oh, able yeah. to get the true, the true emotion by not understanding the language. And I think that was one thing that stands out in my, all of my years of traveling uh, uh, around the world, speaking against the death penalty and looking, uh, uh, looking for justice. We have to take a little break at this moment, but when we're back, Claude, Sister Marie Francis, and Bud and I will be sharing some more about Catholic teaching about the death penalty, challenges that that causes us to have, and what we might be able to do to actually share the teachings of the church in our local parishes. Stay tuned.
KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. Well, welcome back to the second part of our discussion today on the Catholic understanding of the death penalty. What I'd like to do is bring up one short clip today from Amnesty International. It's very sobering because it reminds us that last year was the worst year in 25 years for executions. Then we're going to hear from Sister Marie Francis of what it is that we might have to do to change this phenomenon. The number of people executed around the world has reached a sobering new record. New figures released by Amnesty International show a 50% rise in executions in 2015. The human rights watchdog said it marked an alarming development, and the real figures could be even higher, as numbers for China are unknown. The dramatic rise in executions that we recorded in 2015 was down to huge increases, primarily to huge increases in just three countries, Iran, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Together, these three countries accounted for almost 90% of all the executions that we recorded in 2015, again, excluding China. Amnesty noted that China regards death penalty figures as a state secret. When asked for comment, a spokesman for the foreign ministry claimed that Amnesty released unfair statements. The organization is campaigning to end the death penalty completely and documented that 102 countries abolished it entirely by the end of 2015. That particular video is only a month old and gives us some very sobering statistics. Sister Marie Francis, you were going to comment on something that Bud had left us at the end of the, at the first half of the show. What would you like to share? Well, I think he mentioned something about the grace of God uh, to, to be open to uh, the gra I don't remember the exact statement, but what came to me was that, um, again, God never gives up on us and always holds out to us uh, the grace to open up so that he may become a healer and we may become healers with others. and. Um, that thought came to me as you were speaking. It was at some point you were talking about meeting with the uh, people who had lost loved ones at 9-11. At and that gets to the very point, I think, of God never giving up on us. And it's for us to keep opening. Pope Francis left us a um, wonderful quote when he ushered in the year of mercy. And I think it's a particular challenge to those of us who believe ultimately, first and, first and foremost, in the dignity of the human person, um, and that God's unconditional love for us. And the biggest challenge is to grapple with this justice-mercy dynamic, which I like to say Bud actually lived that in his own life. But this is what Francis said when he ushered in the year of mercy. Justice and mercy are not two contradictory entities as we in our human minds think they are. There's mercy and then there's justice. But he says that they are two dimensions of the same reality that gradually unfold into the fullness of love. And um, when you hear Bud talking about his story, his journey, to my mind, that is exactly what happened. That dynamic of that contradiction that seems to us to be contradiction when opening to God's grace and moving always more towards greater love of God, greater love of neighbor. That's what happens, and it brings peace. But there's a question that I really 
no, we sort of rehearsed a little and found out you had an answer that was very enlightening to me and not what I expected. I'm going to ask you and then Claude and Sister Marie Francis, what encouragement do you find from the church and from other death penalty abolitionist communities, California People of Faith Against the Death Penalty, Death Penalty Focus, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, all of these groups and the church leading it, what encouragement do you get from them or not? I get some encouragement from them. Uh, the uh, uh, people of faith against the death penalty, uh, death penalty focus, that's more certainly uh, non-religious. And, uh, and then as far as getting, putting faith in what my church does to help aid what I'm trying to accomplish, uh, it's very lacking in my opinion on the support that I, that I get and that others get. And that's because we let the uh, uh, we let the politics enter into it, and too many of our priests and bishops are uh, not willing to touch that because they kind of uh, some people kind of touch that t t uh, treat that as the third rail of, uh, of politics, mm -hmm. which indeed it is not. It's uh, to be honest. I know there's a later question coming up, and I'd like to uh, mention that, and it's. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, I think that uh, uh, why are the uh, Catholic bishops ahead of the laity on uh, on the death penalty? Well, that's it, to my to, in my, to my knowledge, that is really a pretty simple answer, because the laity has not been informed, mm -hmm. and that's the that's the fault of the bishops and the priests. And I have told uh, bishops and priests that all over this country many, many times, and I will go in to visit with a, if I go to a, to a city that has a diocese, I always try to get an appointment with the, with the bishop. And, uh, and I want to ask him what he has done lately to uh, aid in, uh, in abolishing the death penalty or helping people think about that. And so many times they'll, uh, I'll ask them, when did you last send a letter out to, uh, to all your parishes on that issue? And I find that some uh, haven't done it for six, eight years. And when they do, it's, I would call it a, a kind of a light, uh, a light letter. Uh, not very informing. Wow. And, uh, <clears throat> and I mean, I'm being a little tough on the bishops, but I'm, I'm tough on them sometimes. Uh, in fact, I like to be in their presence because you have to get their attention and let them realize that in that area, in my opinion, they are not doing their job correctly. In my view, it's up to the bishops to, uh, to inform the priests and it's up to you know, the priests to uh, instruct their flock. And they do that uh, uh, through the pulpit. But it's very hard to get a lot of priests to address that through the pulpit. I would like to weigh in on that, and I'm in, in full agreement with Bud on that. I think one of the issues facing us today as a church um, with respect to politics, um, I find often within our church population the same ideological divide, if you will, as within our nation right now. and. From my own perspective, I take it as my goal in, in uh, assisting and educating our population. Social justice, it, it's, it's apolitical. As believers, we are gospel-oriented, and of course the fundamental, our fundamental belief is the inherent dignity of each and every individual without distinction and regardless of what they do in their lives and so on and so forth. And to me, the biggest challenge is, and I think it could be part of why our clergy kind of hesitates to speak about those issues from the pulpit, um, because many of our people will consider it political. And if we can somehow, through scripture, one of my favorite scriptures is Philippians, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. 
And uh, the mind of Jesus was giving of himself and relinquishment for the sake of the other. And um, I think in American politics today, uh, as, as a church people, we've, we've, we've lost that sense of gospel. And wherever we are on the political spectrum, that's okay, that's healthy for our democracy to have disagreements about this, but if we could focus on the gospel, this is how everyone should be treated. Everyone should have a living wage. Everyone should have access to health care, all of that stuff. And how does that play out in our economy and so on and so forth? But also the right to life issues, the end of life issues that we're talking about today. I think that's the particular challenge. Yeah. And um, I too, and if somehow we could get our people to think that what comes down to us from our bishops, from our priests, it's apolitical. They're not telling us this is right and this is wrong. But the dignity of the person should be at the heart of our civic participation. And, and to me, that's a huge challenge, particularly here in the Valley. And it's not a question of good people, bad people. And I think that's a point that needs to be made. Claude, we've got about two minutes, but I'm, I'm really thinking your experience and expertise in detention ministry could shed some light on this one. What's your, your share on this? Well, um, in terms of encouragement, I uh, am fortunate because I get to work with uh, the other restorative justice directors in California where we're all dealing with this issue locally and also with the California bishops, which as a group have been very forceful on this question over a period of time and continue to be. Um, about three months ago, I was able to go and was at a conference of people doing ministry all over California, working with the bishops. And we were talking about the issues, of the life issues. And no, we don't explain abortion as being the same thing as a death penalty in terms of moral gravity. However, the reality is what the Catholic Church teaches is the value of every individual human life and its full dignity. And if you cut that short, if you cut that short, if you, if you somehow damage that, if you don't value that human life and dignity, dignity at one point, you're betraying it at all the other points as well. You know, you really in the end can't really be fully and effectively against abortion unless you're going to be defending human dignity at all the other stages of life as well. We have reached, believe it or not, the uh, conclusion of our first program on death penalty in this series called Catholic Social Teachings 101. We will be back next week with an effort to share with you some more that we have not covered. There are some teachings from the popes. There are some very clear directives from the bishops. And there are some real encouraging things that I think Bud, who has been around the globe, feeling the pulse of this universe to understand what is it that we need to do as people of faith to share this message of every life is sacred. Join us next time. God bless. <laughs>